the hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Dan Friedel, Jill Robbins, and Dan Novak. Later, we will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first, here is Dan Friedel. An old steelmaking center in Beijing is getting new life as a place for shopping, eating, and working. Now, it is also being shown on televisions during this year's Winter Olympics. The center has large cooling towers and smokestacks, which are big industrial structures for dealing with pollution and heat. This month, however, they are being seen with the Olympic ski jumping competition known as Big Air. In the competition, the skiers slide down a 64-meter high, 164-meter long ramp to gain speed before they jump into the air and do tricks. As they rise, television cameras show them with the factory in the background. Some people watching used social media to say the images made them wonder if the Olympics were being held in Springfield, the home of the Simpsons family. In the cartoon, Homer Simpson worked at a nuclear power center. China closed the Shugang Steel Factory before the 2008 Summer Olympics to reduce air pollution. Since then, the factory has been turned into a place where people work, eat, and walk on grassy areas. The old parts of the factory are still there, but many of the spaces have been turned into offices. Alex Hall is an American freestyle skier. He said, The crazy smokestack things in the back are pretty cool. Big air skiing is new for this Olympics. The snowboard version of the event happened for the first time four years ago in Pyeongchang, South Korea. The event usually takes place in mountain ski areas or in temporary places inside sports stadiums. But the Shugong ramp is a permanent structure. Other big air events around the world are made using materials that are easy to take down when the event ends. Chinese officials hope that Beijing will be a place for future competitions. The competitors like the ramp because the structure is secure. When they compete on temporary ramps, they do not feel as safe. Some of them said the city ramp is just as good as the ones in the mountains. They are able to do their usual tricks without worrying about running out of space. American skier Nick Gepper compared the place to something you would see in a video game. American-born skier Eileen Gu won gold competing for China in the event on Tuesday. She said permanent ski jumps are a good idea for the sport. She called it fantastic, or really good, and noted that it feels like being on a glacier, although it is in the city. Skier Kirsty Muir of Great Britain called the place amazing and cool. Antoine Adelis of France said he was a little sad to be at the top of the jump and not see mountains. However, he liked how it looked at night with the bright lights. There is a question about how many cities will be able to build a structure like the one in China. 
the ramp in Beijing is built into a larger seating area that can be used for concerts and other performances. Gepper said more competition places like the one in Shugang would help the sport find new fans, since more people can see the event in cities. Zhang Li designed the ramp and said it is supposed to look like a ribbon floating in the air. In the first week of the Olympics, the skiers will use the location. Next week, snowboarders will use it. I'm Dan Friedel. Elsa Desmond knows she is not going to win a medal at the Beijing Winter Olympics. She is not even expecting to place in the top half of the competitors. But Desmond is competing as the first women's luge Olympian from Ireland, and she feels like she has already won. In the sport of luge, athletes race small sleds down an ice track at very high speeds. Luge athletes are called sliders. Desmond will not be in China for long. She competed on Monday in the opening night in the women's luge event, and she is expected to leave on Friday. She plans to return to work in Ireland on Saturday as a doctor. She has delayed parts of her job to compete in the Olympics. As the founder of the Modern Olympics said, "It's not about who wins; it's about the fight to get there." Desmond said. Although she will not win in Beijing, she has already won some fights. She had been given many reasons why she could not compete. She is too short. She did not start sliding at a young age, and she could not balance a medical job with competing in a sport. The biggest difficulty simply might have been that Ireland did not have a luge organization, so she started one herself. And now, officially, she is a luge Olympian. She was the twenty-sixth sled to cross the line in the first run of the women's race on Monday night. At that point, she was in twenty-sixth place, faster than none of the other athletes. That did not matter to her. She celebrated with a large smile on her face. By the end of the night, she was the last in the competition in the thirty-fourth place. I have another job. I have to self-fund. I have all these really visible challenges, Desmond said. But I think everyone's worked as hard as they can to be here. Desmond is a doctor in general surgery at Ireland's South End University Hospital. Her hospital gave her the time off. And her co-workers are becoming big luge fans. The hospital's chief medical officer, David Walker, said her co-workers are immensely proud of her. Desmond has balanced two very demanding jobs. She has been sliding a few months out of the year, and she has been starting a life in medicine. There was a time last season when she had to take important examinations in hotels in Latvia and Germany, where other sliders were staying. I had to stick signs on my door saying "Do not disturb, exam in progress" in about six different languages. Desmond said. Some sliders have even asked Desmond medical questions. I tried to say I'm not on duty. Desmond said. Desmond got the honor of representing her country in Beijing. She also was given the honor of being one of two people holding Ireland's flag during the opening ceremony on Friday. I really was not expecting this, especially at my first Olympics, Desmond said. 
I don't think I can put into words how excited I am to lead out the team. I really hope that I make my country proud. I'm Jill Robbins. How to keep students learning during school closures and other disruptions has been one of the most difficult questions of the pandemic. April 2020 data from the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, found that at least 1.1 billion students in 114 countries were affected by the pandemic and school closures. But inequality among families, schools, and countries means that some students were better prepared to succeed during the disruptions than others. A new study looks at the teaching and learning methods used in 11 countries during the pandemic. The study was carried out by the International Association of Educational Achievement, or IEA, and UNESCO. The survey included more than 1,500 school leaders, 15,000 teachers, and 21,000 students. The large survey received responses from four countries in Africa, three countries in Europe, two in Asia, and one in South America and the Middle East. They were a mix of developed and developing countries. When schools closed, countries' teaching and learning methods differed greatly around the world. Some countries were able to quickly move to online learning but others were simply not able to make that change. In the European countries Denmark and Slovenia, for example, more than 95% of students had access to laptop computers for schoolwork. But in the African countries of Burkina Faso, Ethiopia, and Kenya, fewer than 10% of students had laptops. Overall, 10% of students said they did not have the resources to complete their schoolwork, at least most of the time. Countries that did not have digital resources had other ways to reach students outside the classroom. Educational television and radio broadcasts increased in some places, including Rwanda, Kenya, and Russia. But when schools closed, many students went through long periods of time without any schooling at all. Most students in Burkina Faso, about half of students in Ethiopia, and about one-fifth of students in Kenya did not do any schoolwork for at least four months. Dirk Hosted is the executive director of IEA, one of the organizations that led the study. He said that in all countries, there was concern for the most poor and vulnerable students. Poorer students and students already struggling were the ones who suffered the most during school disruptions. Many could not access digital resources. Many students' families suffered financially from the pandemic, which likely affected their schooling. Some had to spend time caring for family members. In Kenya, for example, 63% of students said one of their parents lost their job during the pandemic. And in Ethiopia, almost half of students reported that they had to care for brothers and sisters at home. That likely left them with less time for schoolwork. Hosted said policymakers need to find a way to reach the students hurting the most. The task for the future is how can we get these students up to speed again so we don't lose them completely and they fall behind even more. Hosted said. The pandemic has also brought attention to student and teacher mental health. A majority of students in eight countries surveyed said their emotional well-being suffered during the pandemic. Teachers also felt the emotional effects of the pandemic. In India, for example, 85% of teachers said they needed additional mental health support. In Russia, 
64% of teachers reported feeling tired most of the time. And a majority of teachers in several of the countries were afraid of being infected with COVID while working. Many countries are listening to what teachers and students say they need. In most countries surveyed, 50% of schools increased support for students and teachers. Many school leaders reported an increase in the use of school guidance counselors and other mental health resources during the pandemic. Teachers also provided more help to students with their emotional and physical health. Hosted said the study shows how schools are more than just places for learning. We saw that schools have a role beyond teaching and learning, Hosted said. It's also a matter of the people's well-being. It's a structure in their life. I'm Dan Novak. Welcome to The Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. There were many changes in the social customs and day-to-day -day life of millions of Americans during the administration of President Calvin Coolidge. Many young people began to challenge the traditions of their parents and grandparents. They experimented with new ideas and ways of living. People of all kinds became interested in the new popular culture. Radio and films brought them exciting news of court trials, sports heroes, and wild parties. The 1920s also was one of the most active and important periods for the more serious arts. Writers, painters, and other artists produced some of the greatest work in the nation's history. Kay Gallant and Harry Monroe take a look at American arts during this exciting period. <laughs> Most Americans approved strongly of the economic growth and improved living conditions during the 1920s. They supported the conservative Republican policies of President Calvin Coolidge, and they had great faith in the country's business leaders and economic system. However, many of the nation's serious artists had a different and darker view of society. They were troubled deeply by the changes they saw. They believed that Americans had become too interested in money and wealth. These artists rejected the new business society, and they also questioned the value of politics. Many of them believed that the First World War in Europe had been a terrible mistake. These artists had little faith in the political leaders who came to power after the war. They felt a need to protest the way the world was changing around them. The spirit of protest was especially strong in serious American writing during the 1920s. Many of the greatest writers of this period hated the new business culture. One such writer was Sinclair Lewis. He was the first American to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. Lewis wrote about Americans living in the towns and villages in the central part of the United States. Many of the people in his books were foolish men and women with empty values. They chased after money and popularity. In his famous book, Main Street, 
Lewis joked about and criticized small-town business owners. Social criticism also was central to the writing of the newspaper writer H. L. Mencken from the eastern city of Baltimore. Mencken considered most Americans to be stupid and violent fools. He attacked their values without mercy. Of course, many traditional Americans reacted strongly to such criticism. For example, some religious and business leaders attacked Mencken as a dangerous person whose words were treason against the United States. But many young people thought Mencken was a hero whose only crime was writing the truth. The work of Lewis, Mencken, and a number of other writers of the 1920s has been forgotten by many Americans as the years have passed. But the period did produce some truly great writing. One of the greatest writers of these years was Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway wrote about love, war, sports, and other subjects. He used short sentences and rough words. His style was sharper and different from traditional American writing, and his strong views about life set him apart from most other Americans. Another major writer was F. Scott Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald wrote especially about rich Americans searching for happiness and new values. His books were filled with people who rejected traditional beliefs. His book, The Great Gatsby, is considered today to be one of the greatest works in the history of American writing. A third great writer of the 1920s was William Faulkner. Faulkner wrote about the special problems and ways of life in the American South. His books explored the emotional tension in a society still suffering from the loss of the Civil War sixty years before. Some of Faulkner's best books were The Sound and the Fury, As I Lay Dying, and Absalom, Absalom. Like Hemingway, he won the Nobel Prize for Literature. The 1920s also produced the greatest writer of theater plays in American history, Eugene O'Neill. O'Neill was an Irish-American with a dark and violent view of human nature. His plays used new theatrical methods and ways of presenting ideas but they carried an emotional power never before seen in the American theater. Some of his best-known plays were Morning Becomes Electra, The Iceman Cometh, and A Long Day's Journey Into Night. A number of American writers also produced great poetry during the 1920s. Probably the most famous work was The Wasteland, a poem of sadness by the writer T.S. Eliot. There also were important changes in American painting during the 1920s. Economic growth gave many Americans the money to buy art for their homes for the first time. Sixty new museums opened. Slowly, Americans learned about serious art. Actually, American art had been changing in important ways 
since the beginning of the century. In 1908, a group of New York artists arranged a historic show. These artists tried to show real life in their paintings. They painted new kinds of subjects. For example, George Bellows painted many emotional and realistic pictures of the sport of boxing. His work and the painting of other realistic artists became known as the Ashcan School of Art. Another important group of modern artists was led by the great photographer Alfred Stieglitz. This group held a major art show in 1913 in New York, Chicago, and Boston. The show presented modern art from Europe. Americans got their first chance to see the work of such painters as Pablo Picasso and Georges Braque. The show caused a huge public debate in the United States. Traditional art critics accused the organizers of the show of trying to overthrow Christianity and American values. Former President Theodore Roosevelt and others denounced the new art as a threat to the country. However, many young American painters and art lovers did not agree. They became very interested in the new art styles from Europe. They studied them closely. Soon, Charles de Muth, Joseph Stella, and other American painters began to produce excellent art in the new Cubist style. John Marin painted beautiful views of sea coasts in New York and Maine, and such artists as Max Weber and Georgia O'Keeffe painted in styles that seemed to come more from their own imagination than from reality. As with writing, the work of many of these serious modern painters only became popular many years later. The greatest American designer of buildings during the 1920s was Frank Lloyd Wright. Wright believed that architects should design a building to fit its location, not to copy some ancient style. He used local materials in new ways. Wright invented many imaginative methods to combine useful building design with natural beauty. But again, most Americans did not know of Wright's work. Instead, they turned to local architects with traditional beliefs. These architects generally designed old and safe styles for buildings, for homes, offices, colleges, and other needs. Writers and artists now look back at the roaring 1920s as an extremely important period that gave birth to many new styles and ideas. Hemingway's style of writing continues to influence American writers. Many painters say the period marked the real birth of modern American art. And architecture students in the United States and other countries now study the buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright. The changes in American society caused many of these artists much sadness and pain in their personal lives. But their expression of protest and rich imagination produced a body of work that has grown in influence with the passing years. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. <laughs> 